Well, hello. I'm one of the freelance lecturers. I am James Hurd, as, as Matthew said, uh, and I've been here for some time, so long that I actually remember when this painting was very carefully analysed in 1989, and I'll talk about that in a moment. I wonder if you share my anxiety going into a gallery for the first time and looking at a painting and thinking, who painted it? When was it painted? What's the subject? So what do you do? You dive at the label, which may be helpful, sometimes not, and um, that label can be frustrating when it says anonymous painter of the 19th century or master of the, Mar the Arkan altarpiece or something like that. And supposing you go into, say, a church or somebody's private house, there's no label. What happens? Well, of course, you look for a signature. So I'm going to start looking at the signature on this painting. And I should say that I do guided tours here, and invariably somebody will say, who's your favourite painting? And of course it's impossible in this great treasure house to have a favourite painting, but I do have a soft spot for this man. So the signature, which is down here at the bottom, says Rembrandt, fake it, 1640. Rembrandt made this in 1640 when he was 34. Now, we do know that the signature is genuine, although somebody's reinforced it at some point. And there's another little word at the bottom, contefacel, which means a selfie, basically. Um, but in those days, there was no term for self-portrait. But we know it's Rembrandt because from his earliest days in Leiden, he liked to pop himself into one of his history paintings or biblical paintings. Um, just like Hitchcock used to do in his film. So we know what he looked like with his great walnut nose. But this signature is interesting because it just gives his first name. When he was working in Leiden, and do go to Leiden, uh, when you arrive uh, at Schiphol, don't go to Amsterdam. Take the train in the opposite direction because Leiden is a wonderful place and less visited. You can see where Rembrandt's house was, I say was, uh, but you get a real feeling of where he grew up. There's the canalised Rhine after which he was named. There's the windmills, etc., etc. So when he was in Leiden sharing a studio with a man called Jan Lievens, he signed himself RHL, Rembrandt Hermansohn, the son of Hermann, Leiden. And then as he got more famous, so it just became Rembrandt Hermansohn. But by this time, the 1630s, he's really made it. And it was said at that time by a man called Arno Hubraken, people had to beg Rembrandt to paint them and then add money. So we're looking at a man at the top of his game. And that is why now he signs himself just Rembrandt. He sees himself as the heir to the Italian masters who also signed themselves with their first name. Titian, Rembrandt, sorry, not Rembrandt, Raphael, uh, and of course Michelangelo. So this is about baton passing. And there's lots of reasons why you can see he's linking to the past. So he's the son of a successful miller. Uh, millers, of course, were quite wealthy in those days, and his father was not simply a miller, but he was in charge of a part of the river nearby um, the house. By the time he's painted this picture, he is hugely successful. He has married Saskia van Aulenburg, whose painting you can see there. She was a son of patrician from Leeuwarden. You can still see her house. Uh, her father was a burgomaster, so he's, he's married well above his station, if you like, and he's bought the great house, which is now the Rembrandt house. So you can see how successful he is when he painted this portrait. And if you look for a moment at Saskia, you can see she's dressed up in Arcadian costume. And you get the feeling that Rembrandt here is enjoying dressing up. And in fact, just before he painted this in 1637, the uh, Dutch National Theatre was founded. And then the next year, in 1638, the Schauburg, or the City Theatre, was founded. And we have no evidence, but I'm sure that Rembrandt loved the theatre. 
and we know that when he was teaching, he would get his students to kind of reenact some of the biblical stories, the idea of it, or, or classical stories, the idea of it to, to, to make them more vital when they actually painted them. So here he is with fur at his collar, he's got a fine, fine shirt, a magnificent hat, um, and you get the feeling that he's got a, a bunch of old clothes, costumes, that he's dressed up. But the interesting thing is, we have found no record of him having uh, old costumes. We have a record of him buying lots of beautiful fabrics, armour, etc, etc. And if you go to the Rembrandt house, uh, they reassembled some of these objects that he actually had in his studio. It's very common for artists to have uh, objects that sort of inspire you in different ways. But costume experts have pointed out there's something a bit odd about this costume. They're not everyday clothes. In fact, they are clothes from the 16th century. And one of the uh, artists that Rembrandt really loved was Lucas van Leyden, also from Leiden. He was basically a printmaker. And if you look at pictures by Lucas and of Lucas, there's a wonderful drawing by Dürer, he is wearing the costume that you see there. And we know that Rembrandt bought prints by Dürer Lucas van Leiden. And you see that costume. So what he's doing here, he said, I am the heir to the Italian Renaissance, and indeed, if you like, the, the early Dutch Renaissance. He was talent spotted back in Leiden when he was 23 by a man called Constantine Haugens. Now this man was very, very special. He was your Renaissance man. He translated John Donne's poems into Dutch. He was a great musician. He wrote 80 songs, he wrote plays, he was a great linguist, you know, he was your Renaissance man. He was terribly interested in painting and the arts. At a time when the Stadtholder, he was secretary to the Stadtholder, Fred, Frederick Hendrick, who was less interested. So he goes to Leiden, he goes to the studio, which you can still see if that was the real studio, where he was practicing with uh, Jan Lievens, and uh, he was amazed at what he found. But he advised Rembrandt and Jan Lievens that they should go to Italy. Why? Well, that was what every artist should do, to go and look at the great masters. And Rembrandt and Jan Lievens both refused. And Hagen said this, oh, if only they could be acquainted with, acquainted with Raphael or Michelangelo, how quickly they would surpass them all. They have no time to waste on foreign travel. And that was something of a rebuke. Uh, and Hagen's thought that Rembrandt was very, very special. But after this uh, refusal, uh, he seemed to go cold, it has to be said. And it's interesting that uh, the court, such as it was, um, bought one or two paintings by Rembrandt and it's thought as a result of Constantine Hagens, and incidentally we do have a portrait of him, but it's currently in Boston um, by a man called Kaiser, who also designed the town hall in Amsterdam, another Renaissance man. The reason he didn't go to Rome was that Rome actually came to Amsterdam. Amsterdam was one of the places where you could see fantastic sales, such as Christie's and, and Sotheby's. And he went, Rembrandt, to one of the greatest sales ever, it was considered. And what he saw there was a painting by Raphael. Raphael's portrait of Castiglione, which is uh, now in the Louvre. Not only that, but he saw, uh, whilst he was there in Amsterdam, we're not quite sure where, but another painting by Titian, which is in room two, of a man with a blue sleeve. And the pose mimics that Titian. You see, he's pushing his arm out. He looks as though he's in a window, doesn't he? But we have to be a bit careful about that because originally the painting, the canvas, was rectangular and it's been cut down at some point. Uh, there are lots of Dutch paintings with circular windows, so be careful on that. But nevertheless, he seems to be looking out. Um, one of the things about places like Amsterdam, 
with the dark houses, you see people looking out all the time. Uh, and quite often they have a mirror so you can see down the street and the old ladies look out. So there he is looking out. So Rafael Castiglione was bought by a man called Lopez, who was uh, Portuguese, at this auction in 1639, a year before this was painted. We know Rembrandt was there because he made a little sketch of it, he dated it, and uh, he also explained uh, how much that the uh, Raphael went for. Quite often he would take his students to these auctions so they could see different kinds of paintings. Uh, he also took his students sketching in the countryside. It seems that he, as a teacher, um, was very radical, although in some ways less so. He was conservative in the sense that if you look at a lot of his students' drawings, they all look rather like Rembrandt's. He didn't actually encourage them to be themselves. We know that Rembrandt owned a Raphael, but we don't know what it was because the description doesn't really help us in any way. And of course, Rembrandt was a great spender when it came to collecting, and as you know, later on, he did go bankrupt. And it was that catalogue of his works that enables us to see what he had in his studio. So this uh, famous Raphael went for 3,500 guilders. Well, that's kind of meaningless sum, but it was a huge amount of money. When this painting in 1989, uh, and we had this amazing exhibition called Art in the Making, it was the first of a whole series, and it was devoted to Rembrandt. They made an x-ray, and what it showed was not one hand, I'm sure you can't really see this, but I'll try and describe it. Um, over there, you see one hand, his right hand, um, as, as he leans on this sill, but you saw the fingers of his left hand, quite distinctly here, which led art historians to think, what else had he been looking at? Well, Almost certainly he had seen a self-portrait by Dürer, which is now in the Prado, and it shows those interlocked hands. The other interesting thing is, as we're moving up from the hands, you'll see that he has a chain on which there is a crucifix. Now that seems rather unusual, because one of the reasons that Rembrandt left his native Leiden and there were many reasons. One was the big cities offered more work, clearly. But Leiden had all kinds of religious problems between the remonstrance and the counter-remonstrance. And it got so big and so bad that a wall was actually built around the town hall to keep the two parties apart. So if you were Catholic, if you were Protestant, it was always going to be difficult there. Rembrandt's father was a Catholic converted to Calvinism. And yet there is a crucifix there, but it, in fact, it doesn't really betoken his allegiance to one sect or the other. He was very spiritual. His religion was the Bible. But it seems that he was in neither one camp nor the other. So he was not part of the Dutch Reformed Church. So it seems that that crucifix, and incidentally he made an etching the year before of the same subject, and it's much, much clearer. You can actually see that it's a crucifix. Now, does it actually matter that Rembrandt borrowed all these ideas from other people? No, it doesn't, and that's something that's happened in the past. One thinks of Michelangelo copying Masaccio, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, Nobody actually creates in a vacuum. We're always looking around. However, this painting is very different from the uh, Titian on which it's mainly based, because the Titian has Mediterranean blues, whereas here it's basically browns, isn't it? Endless sequence of wonderful browns. And the other thing that is different is that it has no idealisation, which, of course, was something that the Italians... Um, always did in their portraits pretty well. And it was this um, realism that really upset his biographers. For instance, the Italian, and these are biographers pretty well at his time, Beldinucci remarked on Rembrandt's ugly and plebeian face. 
his untidy and dirty clothes, as though that had got anything to do with his painting, but it was the sort of image he projected. And then the German Sandrart also deplored the fact he'd not visited Italy, where he might have studied the theory of art. This is a quote again. This was a defect all the more serious, since he could only read Netherlandish poorly and therefore gained little from reading. Well, that's a complete lie, because Rembrandt attended the Latin school in Leiden, which you can still see, where all the lessons were in Latin. Uh, so he had a, a superb education, and then he enrolled for the local university, presumably to study religious subjects, because that was the, the emphasis in Leiden University. He enrolled, but never actually attended, and we assumed that he decided he was going to be a painter. The Dutch Hubraken also was appalled by Rembrandt's unflinching realism. And he quoted a poem by a man called Andries Pels. If, as he sometimes did, he painted a naked woman, he took no Grecian Venus as his model, but rather a washerwoman or a peat treader from a barn. He called this idiocy copying nature. So you can see how different he is really from the, the Titian. So here we have the master, warts and all, with that distinctive nose. He made some 80 portraits. That's a huge number. Uh, I can't be sure that it's 80 because it depends on which art historian you read. They give or take a few more. Some of them, of course, are etchings. And in his early days, he made these wonderful etchings of himself pulling faces tiny little things uh, and by the time we get to the 1830s they become more sedate and you get this feeling that he's slightly puffed up you know he's a man who's made it you will notice there's no brushes there's no palette here he, he's painted himself uh, as a gent or a, a painter of a different period so why did he make so many portraits well this is one of the great puzzle but you have to remember that uh, in the golden age in Holland, or in the seven provinces. Uh, the churches didn't want any decoration, so the artists reinvented painting. So they brought in new subjects, such as still life. They painted their own landscapes. They painted urban landscapes, and of course, endlessly, they painted their own portraits. And what we have to remember, that the court in uh, the Netherlands was very different from the court of, say, Charles I, Philip II, uh, or what was happening in France. So you don't get the same court painter with all the sort of glamour that comes with it. Basically, people were painting on spec, apart from if it was a portrait, and you hoped that you would then sell these paintings. Quite often, well, like off the railings, they were sold at fairs, they did have art markets, there was one certainly in Antwerp next to the cathedral, or you could perhaps go to the, the studio. So it was a whole different setup. They had to devise a new way of marketing their work. And you have to remember, of course, we're entering a new phase in the Netherlands. Um, eight years after this was painted in 1648, you have the Treaty of Munster, when the Dutch finally threw off the shackles of the Spanish. But already they were beginning to kind of feel uh, they had got control of their country. The 12-year truce from 1609 meant that suddenly lots of, uh, of artworks were being produced in huge quantities. So the new merchant class, because essentially it was a bourgeois country, they wanted themselves uh, painted. But who to paint? Who would paint them? Well, one of the things that these artists would did were made self-portraits. They made self-portraits so that you could see what, for instance, Rembrandt actually looked like. This was a kind of publicity. The aristocracy had a very modest power in those days. Uh, and when we look around these rooms, you can see so many of the paintings are of the burghers or, or the middle classes. This painting, uh, we don't know who it was made for or who bought it, because it, it, it was acquired by the gallery in 1861 from uh, a General Dupont in France. And that's basically all we know about it. So we assume it was painted by Rembrandt 
for this purpose. And it's interesting that when uh, we looked at his possessions, when he was bankrupt, there was not one self-portrait. He obviously all given them away, sold them, what have you. And a lot of them ended up in important collections. Charles I, Cosimo III um, in Florence. So the great and the good wanted portraits of Rembrandt. And we know that when Rembrandt finally was uh, at the end of his life, and in some ways less popular, um, Cosimo III actually came to visit him in his studio. So all was not lost. Uh, and was it there that he found yet another portrait? The other thing about the self-portrait is that uh, this was a market economy. If you didn't sell your painting, of course you were in, in bother. So a lot of these artists had second careers. Rembrandt was a teacher. He was also an art dealer. And do go to the Rembrandt house. You can see the, what's called the floor house, where there was a chair where the clients would sit and they would look at paintings by other people whilst Rembrandt gave them a glass of chilled white wine. How they know that, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> whilst they looked at the paintings. Vermeer also was involved in art dealing. Um, or Philip de Corning had a barge business. Van der Hayden was an engineer. So if things went wrong, they had a, a second job. So let's actually look at the painting itself, which I haven't actually described to you. And it's unfortunate that you're miles and miles away and it's stuck in this corner. Well, Rembrandt is turning towards us. And I think this is one of the differences between this and the Titian. The Titian seems very posed as he leans on the same sort of parapet. But here you get the feeling that Rembrandt has probably been looking along here and he's just turned to look out. And it gives the painting rather more tension than the Titian. Not only that, but gosh, portraits can be boring, can't they? because they can be rather still and dull, only of interest to the family, maybe, and the sitter. But what Rembrandt's done to make it sort of interesting is that his sleeve here has got a kind of Baroque twist to it. Uh, it's as though the air has blown it into this wonderful shape, this serpentine shape. And then you look at the background, and the background actually changes. One of the things that artists often do is to manipulate the background so you have an outline that is found and lost. For instance, down here, it disappears almost, in, so we can't see the, the um, outline of his wonderful striped tabard. On the other side, it's much lighter. Down here, there's a wonderful contrast again. And if you look at, for instance, his hair, at one point it disappears into his beret. It is a berry and you can't see the top because he sort of turned it up um, rather rakishly, rather like, you know, those hats are turned around that the kids wear nowadays. Um, one of the things to really look at in this uh, painting by Rembrandt are the textures. Um, now, his painting is relatively smooth at this period. Uh, it was a kind of painting uh, that the Dutch call fine shielders, fine painting. Uh, it's not as textured as his late works were. Nevertheless, you can see some wonderful textures. And round here, in the nape of the neck, he's done that familiar Rembrandt thing of taking the wrong end of the brush and scratching into the soft paint to actually create, yes, difficult to see, uh, but nevertheless, that he's done. So he's playing off uh, the fur against the uh, linen shirt, He's playing off the, oh, do have a look at the hand, because the hand has just moved. There's a kind of softness about it there. Um, so there's that feeling that uh, he is turning around and, and searching. Those eyes are searching. It is quite extraordinary the way he actually looks at her. And one of the, th looks at us, one of the things that Rembrandt does again and again, he will put one eye in shadow. And one of the things about shadow is it pulls you in, doesn't it? It's like having shadow at the back of a garden. So we look towards that eye, um, and the eyes are slightly different. Rembrandt uh, played around with his facial hair 
because in the etching made just before this, he's got a kind of Van Dyke beard, but that's rather disappeared here. Not only that, but sometimes he had a kind of a lock of hair, which the aristocrats used to uh, wear. He didn't have one, but he would put it in his painting. So although this is realistic, uh, it's sort of looking both ways into fantasy and to realism. Why Rembrandt, I think, makes such a wonderful self-portrait, or indeed wonderful painting, is a sort of texture. Now this is very, if you would put your hand across, it's very, very smooth. But it hasn't got a mask. If you look at some portraits, it's almost a smooth mask, and you feel you cannot penetrate beyond that mask. He was greatly influenced by Caravaggio, although he wouldn't have seen an original. And in Caravaggio, the drama comes from the gestures, the relationship between the figures, the lighting. But quite often, I feel you can't get inside the spirit because of the very smooth way of painting. This is relatively rough. It's as though the pores are open and you can actually get into the man. I don't know if you agree with me in that way. But for me, what is, is superb is this extremely limited palette. Um, I mean, the, the skin tone is white, a yellow with a, a little uh, red ochre, so a sort of dull red, uh, and that's it. He creates a blue. You'll notice there's a blue down the side here where he's shaved under the eye slightly. There is no blue there. He manipulates the paint, making it thick and thin. If it's very thin and goes over... Um, <laughs> Uh, it must have white and it goes over a, a darker a ground, as it's called. It can go slightly blue, uh, something we see in Velasquez. It's, you know how smoke looks blue against um, a dark wall, for instance. It, it's that same uh, physical attribute. Um, so he is the master of oil paint. They're not all great masters, are they? We think of Leonardo, whose, whose experiments in oil paint were not always entirely successful. So there were two attitudes towards portrait painting. And one of the problems is there are so many portraits. And one of the great writers at the time, the uh, Dutch Vasari, was a man called Carol van Maander. And he said in his Schilder book, The Book of Painting, Portraiture is merely a side road to art. It's a thirst for easy money. Is that what this is? I don't think so. I'm going to go back to Christian Hagens, who said a portrait is a miraculous digest of the whole man, both in body and spirit. And for me, that's exactly what that is. Thank you very much. <laughs>